Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And I'm happy to have with me tonight uh, Brother Jason Cripps and Sister Renee. Sister Renee, we're, I, I'm sure that I'm not the only one that's happy to see you. Everybody's been very concerned for your health, praying for you. And I think everybody will say, hallelujah, she feels well enough to participate tonight. So say hi to everybody, uh, Renee and, and Jason, before hey we guys. get started. Uh, thank you for the well wishes. I'm still in bad shape, but they've given me some new medicine. I've done some treatment so I can sit for a little bit of time. So my blood pressure is down a little bit. I can think a little better. But if I get in too much pain, I'm going to cut the camera off and just pace and try to do audio. But I want to be with you guys. I miss you very much. And I just want to say thank you and Happy New Year. All right. Great. Brother Cripps, say hi to everybody. For those people who do not know about your channel, to introduce your channel to them quickly. Oh, sure. Uh, hey, everybody. Jason Cripps. My channel is True Story Live, and we come on Sundays at 9 p.m. Um, I'm happy to be here. And, of course, I'm thrilled, like everyone else, uh, to even have Renee back on the show. So um, it's going to be a great night and a great study. I'll keep it short. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is the Wednesday night Bible study. We've been doing this now for several months, and we've accomplished a lot already. We completed a, a Bible study on uh, the sermon by uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, Warrant of Faith. Uh, we completed a study on uh, the sermon by um, Jonathan Edwards, um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. We completed a study on the, the sermon by Paul Washer, Examine Yourself. Uh, and now uh, we are in a study on the Pauline epistles. And right now we've reached the point of Romans chapter 5, verse 14 is where we'll begin tonight. Um, so the, I'm mentioning all this is because uh, if you're not aware of that, I, I hope you will go to the playlist, uh, Wednesday Night Bible Studies, and uh, check it all out. And uh, I think there's a lot of really great studies in there for your consideration. Um, all right. Uh, to give us a little bit of context, I'm going to read from uh, verse 1 through to 14. Uh, uh, and then we'll pick it up studying at verse 14. But uh, let me just read this portion. Here's Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come. Hey, Luke. Yes. 
there any way since I wasn't here to point out one of the verses from last week's study that I just saw? Yeah, uh, that's what I was just going to ask you to do. Uh, since you didn't get to speak on these uh, these verses earlier, here's an opportunity. Talk about any part of this uh, chapter you want before we get into the verse 14. Yeah, overall, it's just saying, hey, through Adam, one guy's offense, we all have the death sentence. And through the work of Jesus, one man, his obedience, we all have life. It's that simple. Uh, but unfortunately, most people think Adam's more powerful than Jesus. Oh, they, they accept that uh, we are under a curse because of Adam, but they won't accept that we have the free gift of eternal life through Christ alone. But the reason I, the only verse I really wanted, I'm sure you guys uh, went over it very thoroughly before, but the one verse I would like to mention is one that is speaking in past tense and future tense, and it causes some confusion because people seem to think, because it says we were reconciled, and since being reconciled, it confuses people as if salvation is some kind of process. But I've explained before that we were saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of it in our daily lives as we grow in spiritual maturity, and we will be saved from the very presence or existence of sin when we get our glorified bodies. So with that in mind, go ahead. Oh, yeah, and Roger wanted to say hi. Yes, Roger Hi, everyone. Hi. hi. Quinny is busy killing hi. mice. Uh, so, it, and that's in uh, verse number 10. It says, for if when we were enemies, so that's past tense, we're not enemies anymore, we were reconciled to God. So we're reconciled to God. That's a done deal. By the death of his son. See, it has nothing to do with us. Much more being reconciled, he say, okay, now that you're reconciled because of what Jesus did, we shall be saved by his life, as if salvation's a future event. But he's not talking about salvation from the uh, second death or salvation from uh, uh, hell or sa eternal salvation. He's saying we were reconciled, we were saved from the penalty of sin, we shall be saved by his life. That means him living in us, we will be saved from the power of sin, the wrath of God, and the curse in our earthly, temporal, experiential lives uh, with Christ in us, living in us. That's what that meant. So I just wanted to address that so that people weren't confused. All right. Very good. Uh, and, and tonight we're beginning with verse 14. So why don't you uh, pick it up on that verse and give us your thoughts on okay, that. Well, it says, uh, even though the law hadn't been given yet, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. We fell short of the glory of God. Uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Without the law, this death sentence was still there. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So he's saying, those born seemingly innocent were also under the death sentence, even though they hadn't even sinned yet, because we inherited this in our flesh. Our, uh, we are dead in sin when we're born. That's why we have to be born again. So he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Everybody dies. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come. So Jesus is the second Adam or the last Adam, the one that doesn't sin, uh, the, that ha couldn't sin. So Adam's uh, sin caused us to be, caused us to die. And Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and his life gives us life. It's, it's that simple. With Adam, we die, and with Christ, we live. It, it really is uh, the simplicity of the gospel. You know, they say it's not fair. You know, you can't live that way and be saved. Well, you know, technically, it's kind of not fair that we're born under the death sentence because uh, we don't have eternal life. We, uh, But in God's mercy, he allowed us to die in these physical bodies lest we live forever in this fallen, diseased, uh, uh, aging, sinful flesh. So it really is the mercy of God. 
And so we're redeemed. We have a new reborn spirit born into God's family. So now we're alive in Christ and he will, this dead flesh, it's still the old man. The flesh is not perfected. The old, that's why it says, put on the new man, take off the old man. This old man is still the old man and he will war against the spirit. But one day we'll have that glorified body. So that's why you have to be born again. See, he says, just like Adam, uh, even though we didn't uh, born, born, not sinning like Adam did, we still have the death sentence uh, and not doing any righteousness. We have the gift of eternal life. Just through Adam, we fall through Christ. We live. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Brother Cripps, uh, we're on verse 14, but if you would like to go back and uh, connect in, in the dots at all, feel free to do that too. Oh, thanks. I think Renee did an excellent job. The only thing I'll do is comment on uh, 14. Um, I wish more people understood this, uh, especially from a dispensational kind of thing. This this verse right here makes it incredibly clear of, of how sin works. And Renee pointed that out as well, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Um, also, the shadow of uh, of Christ that is to come, and of course for us has come, and it's always been under the same um, same way that people are saved. Uh, before the cross, it was uh, the promise, and uh, uh, after the cross, of course, it was the um, imputation of righteousness. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh the part of the verse, though, that is uh, some people would find objectionable uh, if they don't understand uh, the transgression. It's, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after this. So, you know, there's, all, there's this uh, question that the church is asking and debating, and, and there's, are we... Um, are we sinners because it's our nature or are we sinners because of our actions? And uh, it's our nature. We're born dead uh, spiritually. That's, if you put all the scriptures together to talk about this, you can only come to conclusion, run to conclusion that Adam and Eve died spiritually on the day that they uh, transgressed and something happened in their gene code, I think, in their, in their humanity, the, the spirit of God, which was connected to their spirit, withdrew. And so they're, they have a dead spirit. That's why when the Bible says that the day that they eat thereof, they will uh, certainly die. Um, and yet they live for hundreds of years. So is the Bible incorrect? Or did they die in a different way? They died spiritually. And the Bible also says that here, in this verse here and other verses, that all of us, after Adam, all the descendants of Adam, uh, also, we have this problem. Even though we have not even done what Adam did, we still have a problem. And that's mortality. And, and that is because we, we have a dead spirit. We, have, we do not have eternal life. The Bible says the only way that you get immortality, the only way you get eternal life is by faith in Jesus Christ for it. So um, some people would say, well, that's that's unfair, but it's just a it's a, it's a genetic disease caused by Adam and Eve that's passed down genetically to every person. And we're all born with a death sentence. The Bible even says the sentence of death is on us. So um, it, when it says even over them that had not sinned, uh, so even before we sin, the problem exists. Even before we're able to think a bad thought or do a bad thing, it's our the problem is in who we are. We are dead spiritually and we are mortal. Let me read this. I like to also look at it in the amplified. Sometimes it's helpful. Uh, it amplifies the verse. And the Amplified says, yet death ruled over mankind from Adam to Moses, the lawgiver, uh, 
even over those who had not sinned, as Adam did. Uh, Adam is a type of him, Christ, who was to come, but in reverse. Adam brought destruction. Christ brought salvation. Um, if you've been following me in these Bible studies uh, for very long, you know that uh, uh, I'm a KJV first. Let's get, learn what we can and rely on the KJV. But if Sister Renee can give, enlighten us by amplifying it, or Brother Cripps can amplify the scriptures for us, let's take advantage of that. In this case, we have a translation called the Amplified, and I'd like to consider what they say too. Sometimes it's, uh, it's helpful. Um, okay, before we go to the next verse, any more thoughts on that, Renee or, or Brother Krebs? I just want to add one thing about what you just said. Uh, the Amplified, the, doing these studies has been very helpful to me, and I think the Amplified does indeed, quote unquote, amplify as well as the opinions of those on the panel. So I just want to tell you, Brother Luke, um, it's, it's been helpful, and I'm, I'm glad you do that. I think it's a, uh, it's a helpful tool. That's all. Yes, and uh, uh, R R Sister Renee, you know, I've heard you say that you're a KJV preferred. I call myself KJV first, and other people say they're KJV only, or and, and others prefer diff different translations, but this is something that uh, we should all have liberty, uh, even though uh, I believe uh, if we compare the other translations to the KJV, often we find serious flaws in them. That's why I would not read the Amplified without having the KJV there to compare. All right. Uh, okay, let's go to the next verse. Is But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Sister Renee, uh, uh, maybe I should alternate so that you're not have to go first each time. Let's, yeah, let's that's have, fine. Yeah, let me ask Brother Cripps, so you can go first this time, verse 15. Okay, uh, verse 15. Um... I'm sorry, I got distracted for a second. Verse 15, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, bounded unto many. Um, through one man, bounded unto many. Uh, it it pretty much, for me, it just is stating that, um, that by Christ's death on the cross and resurrection, that everyone was saved by the grace of God. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to call on Renee first, so I'm a little unprepared this time. <laughs> oh, okay. My apologies. Go ahead, Go ahead Renee. Sorry, there was a, a, a gentleman asking about your username and said, I'm not trying to sound judgmental, but why would you call your username Sin City? I said, because he lives in Sin City, Las Vegas, Nevada, <laughs> not because you're promoting some kind of sin or something. <clears throat> so uh, let me get over to Romans. But uh, what he's saying here, <clears throat> obviously, so not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God. He's saying, although the sin of Adam was powerful enough to condemn everyone that's born, much more, much more hyper is the grace, since they like to mock it. Instead of where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. They believe where sin abounds, grace will diminish. It'll diminish because you got to be good. So what he's saying is that the grace of God abounds. It's hyper. It's even greater than the fall of Adam. So the work that Jesus did is freely offered to all people. Just like all of us are condemned to death because of Adam, much more powerful is God's grace. So it says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. I think it's funny that he says free gift because gift by its definition is free. But I think he's trying to drive home that it really is free because people just can't seem to understand what the word 
gift means. It's crazy how people will do anything, including redefining words to add some kind of qualifier for salvation, for grace. For if through the offense of one, that's Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. He's just saying the grace of God and Jesus's work and the gift by grace of eternal life is greater and more powerful than the sin of Adam. Why? Because the last Adam is greater than the first Adam. Woohoo! Yeah, yeah. See, Thank you. yeah. see <laughs> that's that's why you call in Renee first. Just, 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 just saying. That's why you call on her first. I get warmed that's up a little bit. Funny. All right. Well, I'll, I'll go second if you want, then, or unless you're ready to go, Brother Cripps. Did you want me? Might want me to go next? Yeah, please. I can't follow Renee like that. There's no. <laughs> <way>. <laughs> yes. uh, okay. But here's, here's to me the exciting part of the verse is, but not as the offense. In other words, he's doing this comparison, but he's also saying it's not really a true comparison because the quality is so so much different. The quality of grace, is, is, as Sister Renee says, is hyper, hyper grace. You know, I, I've talked a lot about the word hyper uh, in theology. If you've been listening to me very long. You've heard me talk about uh, hyper dispensationalism, uh, hyper Calvinism, help hyper um, uh, preterism, and uh, the word hyper is, as a prefix means you uh, uh, you've gone too far with something. It's it's an extreme thing. Like ever hyper extended your elbow? My elbow is supposed to bend this far, no more. If you hyper extend it, that's not good. It's bad. Hyper means you've gone too far with that. Well, um, hyper grace is, uh, it's the, probably the only time I could say that we can uh, say it's hyper, but it's a good thing. There's no limit. There's no, there's, it's just, there, the grace is so much God is so gracious that we can call it hyper and not make it a negative thing, but a positive thing. It's just, and it has to do also with the, um, the idea of, uh, unmerited. We, we say that uh, the definition of grace is unmerited favor. Uh, God is so gracious, and that's what grace is. It's when you're kind to someone and they don't even deserve it. Like, let's say you, if you had a friend or family that's done a lot of nice things for you, and then maybe you invite them over and give them a dinner, well, that's not really being so gracious because they've done so much for you. But if you meet someone that's never done anything for you and you extend, open up your home, invite him in, and you give them a new set of clothes and you help them out and, uh, in that way, that's grace. They did nothing. There's no merit on their part. They didn't deserve any kind of kindness from you in that way. Uh, and that's what the grace of God is towards us. Uh, so um, I, that's why I believe this first part here is, is worth really um, elevating, but not as the offense. Uh, let me read it in the Amplified, and, and let's see how that phrases it. By the way, Brother Luke, yeah. these people, it says that those that think themselves are righteous, they despise others. Those people that mock grace is hyper grace. They despise that God gives of his grace freely, and it just proves that they're self-righteous. They despise others, and they think they are the ones that deserve grace. But you can't earn grace and they hate it. They don't want it to go that far. How mm -hmm. dare that person get God's grace and God's love and forgiveness and the free gift of eternal life. But I did so much more for it. Yeah. And so whenever somebody mocks the gospel as hyper, it's bitterness and resentfulness because they don't think you deserve it. Mm -hmm. I'd like yeah. to add something to that one point really quickly. And that's the, the prodigal son's brother that refuses to come into the the supper for amen, the son. Amen. Amen. Most people forget about that guy. Well, who came to my mind was the uh, Pharisee praying at the temple wall, uh, who was um, not didn't want any grace, anything extended to the others. He, you know, he thought he deserved to credit and recognition from God for all the good things he's done. He's not like these other people. 
Um, but in the Amplified, uh, it, this is how it's phrased, but the free gift of God is not like the trespass because the gift of grace overwhelms the fall of man. I love how they state that. That's, kind of, that's the point we're, we're trying to make here is that this, this free gift of God, God's grace is, is, even though there's a comparison being done in the previous verse, it's, he's actually saying, well, it's not really a good comparison. It's not like the trespass because the gift of grace overwhelms the fall of man. For if many died by one man's trespass, that's Adam's sin, much more abundantly did God's grace and the gift that comes by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to benefit the many. So uh, I think that this 15 is kind of Paul backing up and all, not really correcting, but clarifying verse 14 for us. He says, yet the death ruled over mankind from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned as Adam did. Adam is a type of him, Christ, uh, who was to come, but in reverse. Adam brought destruction, Christ brought salvation. I read that in the Amplified too, sorry. But uh, yeah, so uh, in verse 14, he's, he's drawing this comparison, but in verse 15, he's, he's making a correction. Well, it's not really a good comparison because the, the, the gift of God, it's not like the trespass because the gift of grace overwhelms. It's so overwhelming. It's so hyper, as Renee said. Okay, uh, I'll go to the next verse unless you want to say more about that, either one of you. Okay. I, I'd like to say one thing, and that's the, uh, the, the key word there is free. It's, it's free. So the very people that we're talking about have that attitude, they can't believe that God would give his grace to someone that's oh so much lowly and uh, more sinful than they are. And, and, it, and it's because they don't understand what free means. You, you got it. Your key word there you just said is the word believe. They don't believe the gospel, period. Amen. That's all, Brother Luke. Yeah. Uh, there's a few things that I've been trying to really promote. Just little phrases and terminology, and, and I'm hoping that they'll become uh, so common that it's, it's cliche that everybody uses these terms. So far, it hasn't rubbed off. But I'm hoping it will. One is the phrase I got from Brother Ronnie, hood minister. And he says, we have a license to rest. I keep repeating that, hoping it'll catch on. License to rest. Another one is uh, I made a video titled uh, Free Gift Theology. Now, most we and most people of our friends, we kind of identify ourselves in, as a community of free grace believers, the free grace community. Uh, but in my video, I make the point that the term free grace is not in the Bible. The, the concept of grace being free is clearly there. I'm not arguing about that at all. It's Grace is free. It's explained in the Bible that it's free, but we do not find the word grace preceded by the word free anywhere. So since we can't actually show those words in the Bible, I say let's move from free grace to free gift. And, uh, because, and also because the word gift is so easily understood by people, uh, and you don't really have to define it. We, we are making making the effort now to say, hey, it's a free gift, but really it's an oxy, uh, not an oxymoron, but it's redundant because if it, it's got to be free to be a gift, so you're just being redundant. So people understand what a gift is, but they, do they understand what grace is? When we say free grace community, it requires a theological dissertation to them. But if we say it's free gift theology, then it's easy for people to understand. And so right here is one of the examples. I think the term free gift appears at least two, maybe three times. Those words are together. Uh, and uh, so here it's, you find the words together. Uh, is it? Does it say free gift? Yeah. It says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. And, and, and then also, it, and here's in the, in the following phrase, it says, and the gift by grace. So 
you have gift and grace there together. But it's, my point is that we don't find the term free grace in the Bible. Um, I might be making much ado about nothing, but I would love for people on my on my home page. I have certain titles uh, over sections, and one is called the the uh, the gift and the guarantee. The gift, of course, is the free gift of salvation, and the guarantee is the eternal security. You can't lose it. You don't see the words valuable money either, but it's redundant. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but so far, my idea of using uh, the gift and the guarantee and free gift theology hasn't caught, not caught on yet. Okay. Anything else, guys, before we go to the next verse? No, sir. Okay. Uh, all right. The next verse in the KJV, verse 16 and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the way it's written is, uh, Renee, I'm sure you don't have a problem with this. You, you do much better with this kind of language, I've noticed them, than I do. But this kind of uh, writing is one of the reasons I sometimes like to look at the Amplified because I, I get confused the way that's written. But uh, uh, Brother Cripps, do, did you want to go first this time or you want you want me to stick with Renee? Yeah, please stick with Renee. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Renee, go ahead. Verse 16 and, and then... Uh, you guys are a hoot. Okay, let me see. Not as it was, but <clears throat> by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses on justification. So he's saying that because uh, Adam's death sentence came by one offense, Adam's one sin, that the justification comes from all the offenses ever done by man from the beginning of time until the end of time. Uh, so it's just saying that although death came by his one sin that the free gift covers every offense not just the one adam committed but many offenses unto justification so all the sins unto being in right standing with god all those sins are covered mm -hmm. or purged okay uh, let me read it in the amplified and then i'll ask brother cripps to comment on that uh so the distinction you're making is that there was uh, one offense uh, with, with Adam, uh, but uh, after Adam, of course, there's many offenses. Collectively, we've all sinned. I don't know about you guys, but I have uh, over 500,000 sins on my, on my ledger that were wiped away, uh, paid for. Uh, I don't know how many Brother Cripps and Renee have, but uh, I'm just guessing. I don't really, I haven't really counted them. But... Uh, so if we collectively add up all of our sins and then add them all together, uh, that's what the point I think, Renee, you're making there. Okay, uh, so verse 16, the Amplified says, nor is the gift of grace like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment following the sin resulted from one trespass and brought condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift resulted from many trespasses and brought justification, the release from sin's penalty for those who believe. That really clarified it, but it certainly agreed with your your description of the verse, uh, Renee. Brother Cripps? Yeah, I'm finally ready. So <laughs> what what popped in my head was uh, the Three Musketeers chant, all, uh, all for one and one for all. So through all uh, through one man's sin, all have sinned, and then through one man's uh, death and resurrection, all all receive grace. I forgot to turn my mic back on. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, I, I, to me, the way it was written in the KJV, it wasn't clear after Renee, after you explained it, uh, it made sense but I still did not necessarily get it from the, from the verse. But it seems that the Amplified translators, uh, they amplified it the same way that you did, Renee. 
So they 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 interpreted uh, the KJV uh, that the, the same. So they're in agreement with you. But from that verse in the in the KJV, I I would not have got that out of it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I should have uh, read a little bit more Shakespeare as a kid, you know. Okay, verse 17, KJV. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Okay, Renee. Hold on one second here. I'm trying something happened when James got online and I was signed out, so I'm trying to fix it. Okay. All right. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, again, we're saying through Adam's one sin, death came to everybody. Uh, much more they which receive abundance, hyper grace, abundance of grace, and of the gift of righteousness. That's so important. See, people don't understand imputed righteousness because I trust only what Christ did alone to make me in right standing with God. He gives me the gift of righteousness as if I had never sinned. And he sees me as he sees his son, sinless for eternity. And people can't get the, the difference between your positional eternal standing, which is a free gift, from your experiential standing here on earth so the gift of righteousness is imputed on us because we trust christ so it says much more they which receives again it's saying that much more powerful is god's grace and the free gift than the fall of adam he's, he's continuing to say how much more strong and powerful is god's grace than the sin i don't know why people think the sin is more powerful than the blood it's not when Jesus touched a leper, he didn't catch leprosy. The leper got clean. The leper caught cleanliness, you know? So, and if one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Again, it's just saying that the, the gift of God is more powerful than Adam's fall. Okay, um, before I respond to that, I'd just like to say hi to the chat room and acknowledge uh, some people that I haven't seen before here. We got uh, several, Nixon223, uh, welcome. I, I don't remember you being here before. And by the way, Saints, if you're one of the moderators in the chat room, please make an effort to welcome all the new people and uh, make them feel welcome. You are welcome, James. Uh, let me see. And there's... Uh, also, I saw a couple of others, uh, Nixon223, Z Will, you made a couple of good points and questions there already, uh, James Lassiter. I'm seeing uh, several people here for the first time, so I, I, I just want to make you know that you're welcome. Glad to be here, you're here with us. I hope that this is uh, profitable for you, and perhaps you want to join us. Uh, James is Jim Jim. James Lassiter is my son. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll still extend that offer to Jim Jim. Welcome to join us all the time, Jim Jim. <laughs> that's cool. That's very cool. Uh, Pat Salisbury, that's a new name too, and Nixon. So um, yeah, welcome. And uh, as I said, I, I hope that uh, the time with us tonight is uh, profitable and maybe you'll join us every Wednesday and also on our Sunday program that's uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time on Sundays uh, okay now getting back to the, the verse um, I read it in the, in the set the KJV again for if by one man's offense death reigned by one uh, I, I had a friend uh, Bible Jim uh, is, is, is moniker uh, he's kind of the president of the America's Street Preacher Association. But uh, he made one, a big deal one day of, in a Bible study we did about the word if. And he was all excited that, that uh, it, the word if 
uh, people were using it to uh, put, put forth the idea, well, see, it's contingent upon if you do this or if you don't do that. Uh, your, your salvation, it, it depends on that because it says if. Thanks for addressing this, Luke. This is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bible Jim, he made this discovery as, as that uh, he said he's all excited because he, he says that the word if should be understood as since. And uh, he was quite excited about it. But Renee, maybe if you understand this, maybe you can help me. I don't really see if we changed it from if to since how it, how it solves the, the problem that people could say, well, see, uh, since you did it, uh, since you kept the commandments, uh, you know, you're, you stayed saved. It's the same thing with the word may. It's the same thing that he might have life through his name. Might doesn't mean, oh, you might do it. No, it's like, therefore, so you can, is what mm -hmm. it's saying. You know, yeah. he died, so you might have life. He died, therefore, so you can have life. It's just a uh, way old English uh, is the way they spoke is a little different than we speak right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Well, we, we, of course, we're all in agreement that there are no contingencies, uh, you know, no ifs or ands or buts or since, even if you want to put since in there, and then you're putting a condition that uh, you only have it since you've done this. Uh, but, but if it's also an explanation of the past. Like if that happened, then this does. It's kind of like because this happened, then that does. It's kind of like yeah. A yeah. Okay. Uh, let me say hi to my niece. I gotta get rid of her hair. Hello, Linda. Uh, I can't talk. I'll call you back in a little bit. I'm on uh, online with the Bible study. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Um, sorry, everybody. Normally, I ignore my phone, uh, or turn it off, actually. But uh, uh, in this case, uh, she's been depressed, and so I, I wanted to make sure that I acknowledged her and talked to her later. Let her know I call her back. Um, okay. So your point, Renee, is that uh, what was the last thing you said about the word "if"? It, it could be understood as what? Like a because, like yeah, because. this happened and that. It's kind of like, well, because that happened, then it's just a um, if isn't like, oh, you might. Yeah. Just like so you might have life through his name. It said, ooh, or like the word may when it says, turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of flesh that God may save his spirit. Because they try to say, see, he might save him if he were, no, he's saying, turn such yeah. one over to Satan. So therefore he can. But if you put the word can there, it's not proper English. So it has to say may, you know. Yeah. And then another you word, another, to make it conditional or difficult. Yeah. Another word that you, uh, you you threw in there that is creates the same potential problem is the, the word might. Yep. So uh, if you see the word if or since or might or may or these, don't let those words frighten you. There's a, there's an easy uh, explanation for these things. And, and we also... Um, here's here's the I believe it's the number one rule for understanding the scriptures and, and getting your doctrine correct. And that is any of the verses that everybody's arguing about the meaning, do not put your don't depend on those verses for your doctrines. Thank you. But if a verse is clear cut, it's so explicit, there's only one way of understanding it, then you can have confidence. Now, if the verse is saying you're, you're saved, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's saying something very clearly and explicitly, and the point that's made there is repeated in many times. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So if, if they're clear and the point or the doctrine is repeated over and over and over and over, that's how you form your doctrines, not that's on the verse or debating. That's a, that's a great point. You know, they'll have a hundred clear verses on how God will never let you go. He's faithful. He saves you to the uttermost. He'll lose none. Nothing can snatch you out of his hands. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Then they'll take one or two verses that are kind of vague out of context and go, see, nope, 
here. Never mind those 50 clear verses on eternal security. We're going to use these two vague ones out of context to refute the, the rest we have in Christ. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, let me read that verse in the Amplified, and then we'll get Brother Cripps' thoughts on this. Uh, verse 17, uh, For if by the trespass of the one, Adam, death reigned through the one, Adam, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in eternal life through the one, Jesus Christ. Brother Cripps? Yeah, playing off what uh, Renee just said, I, I I keep seeing the problem is that the, the ones that attack everyone else, it's because they're insecure about their own their own salvation. And so why would anyone else feel content and be able to rest in Christ's finished work if they're not resting in it? You got it. They don't like that you have it, and then they don't like the free grace. So they've got to take it from you. How do you think you're saved and you don't live as good as I do? Amen. They, they don't even know us. They just assume all the grace people I know are the most godly, selfless, wonderful people, non just wonderful. And they just assume it's those kind of people that make people say, I hate Christians because they're yeah. not they're not real Christians. No. They're not even in the body of Christ. They're like, I'm going to trust in myself just in case. OK, then you haven't trusted Christ, which means you do not have the Holy Spirit. That's it. And okay. the last the last thing, one more thing, the, the, the word justified, and I'm sure this isn't new to anyone, but back in second grade, I went to a private Christian school, and I remember this from way back then when we were, when we were studying this very chapter. And, and I remember him writing out the word justified on the board and putting lines in it, and he explained just as if I'd never sinned, just as if I just as if I'd never sinned and never will sin again. There it is. That's it. Okay. I have, uh, I hope you find this interesting, uh, a little kind of a quiz for the chat room and, and for us. Um, there may be more than I'm not, I'm not aware of, but I am aware of five gifts that we receive at the instant we believe five gifts. Let's see if we can think of each one of these gifts, what they are. There's five things the Bible says that we are gifts to us who believe. What? What? Go ahead and start naming them. And in the chat room, list them if you if you think you know you know what these five are. First two that pop into my head: justification, justification, and sanctification are the are the first two. Brother, is, is that in? The I'm talking about where the Bible refers to, to that term and calls it a gift. Eternal life. Eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. Okay, that's one. Eternal life. Faith. No, it doesn't say. Well, unless you want to construe uh, Ephesians uh, 2, that's 2, true. 8, 2 8 as a Calvinist does. Uh, understanding, a gift of understanding or revelation. Um, okay, let me let me tell you another one and see if you are on the same page here. Okay, we know that the Bible says eternal life is a, is a gift. The Bible also says that I believe in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, the subject that we should understand what the gift is, is salvation. For by grace are we saved. It's the subject of this whole verse is our salvation. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So ah, some, that's argue, a good point. Yep, yeah, yep. some argue that the gift referred to in that is the faith. No, okay. it is. It says salvation. You're right. Yeah. So salvation is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. Mm -hmm. And there's three more on my list here. Gift of righteousness. Yeah. Uh, he said that, but it's true. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. Righteousness. Did we get yeah. the gift of righteousness? That's imputed righteousness. Brother Jason said that a second ago, I think. I think, you know, he said justification is sanctification. Oh, uh, yeah. The gift, he said much more the gift of righteousness. But, yeah, that's a, that's a gift. And we, got, we got righteousness, salvation, eternal life, and there's two more. Grace. The right. Bible says gift. Right here it said, right, he just got through that verse. It says, it says grace is a gift, right? Yeah, the free gift, and it's talking about grace. Yeah, that's true. 
uh, and the gift by grace. That's and the right. gift. Okay. And then the last one is the Holy Spirit. That's true. The gift of the Holy Spirit. You're absolutely yeah. right. So if you never thought about it, I, I think this is an important thing. I know we're going off, off track a little bit, but I, I think it's important to understand yeah, That's important because none of those things can be worked for. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what people are trying to work for. They're trying to bring, they're trying to work and begging the Holy Spirit to come. Fill me, fill me. No, you don't. You, uh. He said, if you trust in him, then the Holy Spirit comes and seals you. So trust in him. But they won't. They, they're just in case they're going to trust in what they're doing and how good they live. Every single person. Look, if you can't take grace to the extreme, you don't understand the gospel. Do you mean uh, a practicing homosexual it, it can be saved and stay gay? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Will there be consequences on this earth? Is it pleasing to God? No, it's not. And yes, there will be. But everybody's deserving of hell. You are no better. Your sin is no prettier than that homosexual sin. All are equally lost. There is no level of lost and saved here. You are either dead in sin, not practicing sin, or uh, I don't sin, I just stumble, or I make a mistake, and then I repent. No, you're dead in sin, or you're alive in Christ. It's that I, simple. I dabble. I dabble in yeah, sin. Right. I don't willfully <laughs> sin. Uh, you just did. Oh, gosh. It, it's like... Uh, there is no level. It, it's uh, clearly some sin have greater consequences, but it has nothing to do with salvific issues. You are lost or you're saved, period. And you're only saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The works finished from this foundation of the world. That's why we have security, because our foundation is not of ourselves. It's God's gift. It's already finished. It's it's a complete package. He says, I did all the work. Here's the gift that I paid for. Receive it by faith. It is that simple. It is that glorious. And there's so few. Narrow is the way and straight is the gate. And few be there find it. Because Jesus is the way. It is only him. That's it. And uh, I get so horrified because most people will say, well, you know, you're, you're saved, but you can't live any way you want and think you're going to heaven. You're deceived. John MacArthur with his saved or self-deceived. And I'm like, lost or self-righteous. You know, he just, everything's about works to him, but he has the nerve to call his ministry grace to you. There is no grace. It's you earning it. You know? Uh, so here's the thing. They hate grace because that means those people over there get it and they don't like that they get it because they really think they deserve it more. It boils down to it. They have either deceived themselves like Luke says uh, with their uh, RL calls it the law buffet and uh, you call it something else where they lower the standards of the law so much that they think they actually keep it. Mm -hmm. Uh, or they're in constant turmoil, knowing that they fall short because the law did its job and made them guilty. So they never have peace, but they're too scared and don't understand grace. Or they've deceived themselves into thinking that they're somehow actually hitting the mark. Because I've had some people say, oh, the gift is the power of the Holy Spirit to earn your own salvation. So it's still about performance. Mm -hmm instead of the performance of Christ. And this chapter is, how many times has it been said, Jason and Luke, by one man's offense, one man's work, one man's sin, one man's righteousness. It's all first Adam or second Adam. That's it. That's how you get life and death through those two, mm -hmm. you know, and it keeps repeating that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on. But uh, if you were if any, anybody who was not aware of this fact, I think it's an important fact for everybody to understand. At the very instant that we believe that Jesus is our Savior, we're guaranteed eternal life because of Jesus. Then, then they uh, they have the Holy Spirit. That's a gift. 
They have imputed righteousness. That's a gift. They have salvation as a gift. They have eternal life as a gift. And the last one was uh, uh, grace. Grace is a gift. Those are the five uh, things that we have as a gift. And they all happen instantaneously, simultaneously at the moment we believe. Uh, now, I don't want to belabor that point, but we do have uh, someone in the chat room that we need to uh, take just a moment to... Uh, May I add one thing before we move on? Just one thing yeah. related to what we just said. Yeah. So the when Renee was talking, there, this mental image kept popping in my head, and that's the, when when people are considering their own sin and accusing other people, like uh, Renee used uh, someone being gay, for instance. And uh, someone that is dead is dead. Someone that is alive is alive. You're not partially dead. You're not partially alive. So if you're dead in sin, that's it. There, it, it's not a it's not a uh, a dabble it's not a partial it's either you're dead or you're alive so if if you're dead in sin you're completely dead in sin it, it, it's not based on the degree of sin you're dead in sin if you're alive through christ you're fully alive in christ it's not a partial situation yeah um uh, renee I'll, I'll bring it to your attention because this is what you um you focus on your, your ministry is a, really uh, specializes in in addressing this particular problem. But I'm seeing that our new friend here um, is their first time that, that I know of. Uh, Z will he he made a, a comment that he does not believe a homosexual practicing homosexual can be saved, and he says because if you're if you're saved, you have to be forgot it were like sickened or repulsed or something. Uh, nope, that, that's the false teaching of the reprobate teaching of uh, Stephen Anderson. That's yeah. why that is so popular now. Sin is sin is sin. You know what else is an abomination? A prideful heart, a lips that speak its lies, feet that are quick to mischief, sowing discord among brethren. There's a lot of things that are abominations. Uh, and this false reprobate doctrine of Stephen and his Andersonites, they twist that scripture. The people were reprobate, not because they were gay, but because they were in idolatry and God turned them over to a reprobate mind and homosexuality was just one of the sins that they were turned over to. But reprobate doesn't mean unsavable. You can still, if you have a reprobate mind, your, your thoughts are far from God's ways. Yeah. Just like they said, reprobate silver, you'll be called. It has to be refined, a process of refinement. And so a reprobate mind can come to Christ if he opens their eyes to the, the truth and they can come to trust Christ. And then he will begin a work of refinement in them and they'll be no longer reprobate. But that doesn't mean that their old man, the flesh, won't desire the same old things of the flesh that it used to. I do believe once a person saved that it will come to their knowledge and their spirit that it is not God's will and that it is a sin. But that doesn't mean uh, uh, that they can't be saved or if they're really saved, they'll stop desiring these things because uh, sin, uh, it, it dwells within the flesh and the new man is a new creation and we're told to put on the new man, but that's a matter of spiritual maturity and growth. And if you're not spending time with the milk of the word and you're just a babe in Christ, if you don't have milk, you're going to remain a baby. You are not born grown up. You're not born grown. You're going to be a babe. So it's silly to say that. Why is that sin worse than yours? You have heterosexual uh, abominations like adultery, fornication lust in your heart that's no different spiritual it's all pride. of the flesh spiritual pride is another who shall lay a charge to god's elect is god who justifies so that there again like jason was saying we're, you're dead or you're alive period mm -hmm. it's not a matter of which sin is which don't don't think someone else can't get god's grace because their sin looks different than yours it's not degrees yeah. of sin. It's not I degrees. I know. 
Yeah, that's a very important lie, point. Period. It, 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 everything has to be absolute. Okay, either if it if is. if Z will, you're um, it's your first time here. I certainly want you to feel welcome. But we do need to uh, clarify this mistake you're making here that uh, being disgusted with our sin is not a, a requirement for salvation. Preachers we, are doing this, Luke. We, we cannot we cannot impose on someone that I Z Willow feels disgusted when he sins, but you're so that not must disgusted, mean you're not disgusted saved. about your sin. So we then you're not saved. Even saved. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, so, that's uh, good, Luke. But you know what? Preachers are doing that, Luke. Preachers are saying, if you don't hate sin, you don't love God. If you don't, well, we're not saved because we love God, but because He loved us. But preachers are doing this, Luke. They're telling people through their own experience, they're taking what should be qualities of a spiritually mature Christian and placing them as conditions or proof of your salvific issue. And I'm glad you mentioned that because you can't take your experiential or spiritual maturity and try to make these conditions or proof of whether you're saved. Our proof of salvation is clearly God's promise to us, not anything within us. And I think this poor guy has been taught this because John MacArthur said that a man who owned a chain of liquor stores was not really born again because he owned a chain of liquor stores. Well, I'm saying, well, we got to take that to the full extent. And any waitress that serves alcohol in a bar isn't saved then. Any convenience store clerk that works at the liquor store, they're not saved. You know, th this is uh, what preachers are teaching in the pulpit. And people believe it. They don't know any different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, p one thing that a person has to be able to make a distinction uh, b between the event of salvation. It's, it, it, salvation is something that happens. It's Jesus, uh, I guess, gave the very best illustration when he said a man must be born again. And and Nicodemus, he didn't understand spiritual things. Uh, so, so he thinks, well, how is it possible for a, a man to go back inside his mother's womb? And so you, you need that. But it is a good point that just as we cannot go back into our mother's womb and, un, and undo it, because once this physical birth happens, it cannot be undone. It happened. You can't, you'd have to go back in time before the birth to undo it. You can't do that. So the spiritual birth of, of being a born again spiritually from above, this is also an event, and it happens at the moment we believe. Uh, now, once that does happen, think of it as the same way we when we look at humanity. Let's say that we have three people born today. Each one was born right now physically. There's no distinction. No one was born a, a better quality of birth than the other. They were either born or they're dead. Okay, if they're born, they're alive. Now, let's examine their lives for the next uh, 70 years. Okay, one person excels at a young age, nothing but success. Another person, they they do have success, but it's slow and gradual in their life. And the third person. They're just a, a, a failure at everything. Their entire life is a disaster after disaster. But each is still equally a human being. Their identity as a person it has not is not a change or affected by how well they've been able to succeed at life. And it's the same thing when we're when we're born spiritually. We're all equally born uh, spiritually by believing and not any person is any better or has a better quality of the new birth. It's an event that's the same for everybody. But how we succeed in our journey through life in seeking spiritual growth and maturity, that varies greatly from individual to individual. Uh, Z, well, don't impose your feelings of disgust about sin on someone else. That's fine that you're disgusted with sin. I'm, I'm glad that you're, when, if you sin, that you feel bad about it. And perhaps that'll help you to identify it and, and uh, get the victory. But don't impose your feelings and your emotions and your, uh, all of your uh, experiences 
on other people. Otherwise, there's the guy that got born again and he sold everything he owned and he moved to the Middle East and went on a mission and was it was killed by the Muslims. Well, you didn't do that, Z. Will. You didn't do that. So, uh, you know, do we have the right to question your salvation? Because uh, he did something uh, after he got saved that, that certainly illustrates, boy, he was really committed. Boy, he was really serious about it, but you didn't do that. See, if we get into a contest of comparing e with each other, you're going to always find someone that makes you look bad. And you can probably find someone where you look pretty good compared to them. But we're not supposed to be doing that. Okay, we're going to go back into verses unless... Crips and Renee have something else to say. Yeah, I was just going to say we need to do a whole show on the homosexual issue uh, because that has been set aside and it's so hurtful to people. I've had a lot of gay people come to me on my channel on the verge of suicide and, and it, through the grace of God, they heard the real gospel. I'm telling you, I believe not that I'm some great one, but they may have, you know, uh, heard Ralph Yankee Arnold or me or you or somebody, but I'm telling you, these people are at a point of desperation and people are going to answer to that for doing that to these people. Now, just because we say someone is saved regardless, doesn't mean we condone it. Doesn't mean we say God says it's okay. Sin is disgusting. It's horrible. No matter what the sin is. And we're supposed to glorify God in our living. But that is not a salvific issue. That's the difference. People think just because just because we say that a person can be saved and stay saved, even if they are practicing that sin, doesn't mean that we're promoting it or condoning it. We all say, hey, no, it's our reasonable service to live godly lives. So the name of God isn't blasphemed so that we can be a good witness, you know, but uh, that's the difference. You know, people are making these things salvific and you can't do that. And you're taking hope away from people. I mean, a lot of these young uh, gay guys, they some of them are just confused. Uh, and 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 because they're so persecuted and hated and made to hate themselves, it gets worse for them. And they need the love of God, not condemnation. I had one of my. Uh, one viewer told another viewer because his brother had committed suicide and was gay that he was in hell and there's no reason to pray for him. What? Oh, that brings people to Christ. Yeah, uh, the guy was a believer, but he had backslidden. Oh, my God. Well, if you die while you're in a sin, we no. sin every breath we take. Our flesh is sin. What is wrong with these people? They really think that their righteousness has something to do with this old man in this flesh. The bank of, There's your bank. righteousness and God's righteousness. God's righteousness is what we stand on for salvation. Amen. You know, it says he who does righteous is righteous. Yeah, but your righteousness can't save you. It's just like saying, hey, he who reads is a reader. It's just a statement of fact, you know. So it's so, so sad. I'm sorry. We'll go ahead and finish up this uh, chat. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Z will, um, I'm glad you're here. I hope you continue with us. Uh, but I'm sure we'll talk more about this. If you stick around, we'll keep talking about this. Uh, but you, you said here that uh, we shouldn't promote sin. Yeah. We all agree with that. We're not promoting sin. We're, we're, we're Brother, telling we're everybody that sin uh, I'll tell you two things about sin that I'm certain about. One, everybody's sin has been paid for on the cross. The homosexual, the Z wills of the world, the brother Luke's, all of our sins have been paid for, okay? However, sin in this life still comes with consequences. When we, when we do things that are not what God wants us to do, then uh, we are not going to get away with it. We're going to have health consequences. We're going to have legal consequences. We're going to have relationship consequences. We're going to have psychological consequences. No one gets away with their sin. And we're going to tell people, uh, no matter what the sin is, if the Bible says something's wrong, we're going to agree. Yeah, it's wrong. Don't, you should not be doing that. You're going, to, you're going to suffer some consequences for it. But I'm not going to tell someone that this is... a uh, required to get out of your life uh, otherwise you're not saved that's where the that's where we separate and draw the line um 
All right, can we go to the next verse? Anything else? Okay, yeah. verse 18. I want to add one thing just really quickly on this on this particular okay. topic. So if someone is an alcoholic and they're wrecking their life and they're overcome by alcohol and they they uh, come to Christ, they believe in, in his uh, resurrection, that he died on the cross for their sins and they actually become saved, are they going to continue being an alcoholic and allowing that to wreck their life? Is the Holy Spirit that's in them going to allow that? No. It's the same thing if you're gay. It's whatever sin you commit in your life when you come to Christ, that Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that's in all of us that, that have that same acceptance, is going to lead the person away from their sinful behavior. But also, you know what? That is a choice to either grieve the Holy Spirit and remain in this self-defeating horrific, because you can, you can be saved and still be addicted, yeah. still grieve the Holy Spirit, but you'll never sin without pain, consequence, guilt, conscience, right. misery ever again. You'll I'm not, saying, you won't be able to do it with impunity. You will I'm, feel awful. I'm saying it's not up to the people looking on the outside. It is a relationship but, with the Holy Spirit. You got it. You're right. You're right. Any change in that area is a deep seated heart change that comes with spiritual growth by the prompting of the Holy Spirit and cannot be done from an external source based on will worship of a person's willpower. You're absolutely right. Well, I would I would say that uh, just as I cannot save myself, I need the Savior to save me. I also cannot change myself and get sin out of my life. I need the Holy Spirit to transform me. But I also know that the Holy Spirit, as it attempts to transform me, that I can either cooperate or resist it. Okay. Yep, yep, I agree. All right, let's go to the next verse. Uh, this is verse 18 in the KJV. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Renee, you're the designated leadoff hitter. Yeah, I, I, I use this verse often off the top of my head uh, by the disobedience of one and by the obedience of one. And I say... You're saved by the obedience of one, and you ain't the one. You know, everybody's always, but you must be obedient. Yeah, obey the gospel. That's what you got to do. This is the work of God that you believe on he whom he sent. So therefore, as the offense of one, that's the first Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Again, it's clearly saying, first Adam, all die. Second or last Adam. All live. It's much more powerful than the fall. The redemption is much more powerful than the fall. The promise is much more powerful than the sin. The free gift of eternal life, uh, the shed blood of Christ is much more powerful than the death sentence. And it's all based on the first or the second Adam. Not you personally. I keep saying salvation is done a work that's done outside of yourselves. It is of the Lord. That's why it says salvation is of the Lord. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. See, the, the thing is, is that most Christians, they're not Christians. I do not consider them part of the body of Christ. And I know that sounds very harsh, but they do not believe the gospel. You can muddy it up and try to be, oh, we just semantic. No, they are unbelievers. Christ is of no effect to them. He's dead in vain. They don't believe the gospel. They're being justified by the law. They're being justified by, they're, they're, they're relying on their own righteousness, ignorant of God's righteousness. And so they, they don't have righteousness. So uh, to me, if you don't understand, that it's by the obedience of one, the last Adam, the second Adam, whatever you want to call it, Jesus Christ, that you it's his obedience that gives you eternal life. That's why it's claiming right here, even so by the righteousness of one, 
and you're not the one. The free gift came upon all men under justification of life. It's all Jesus. Amen. Okay. Brother Cripps, you ready? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so 18, therefore, the offense of one judgment came upon all men combination. It's the same judgment on all men. It's very, very simple. And then by that, in that same way, came the, the gift from one man that covered all. And there's that word again that I love, the justification, just as if I've never sinned. And that is unto eternal life, which, Brother Luke, you described as one of the five gifts. By the way, I uh, appreciate that. I'm going to go back to that later. <laughs> That's good stuff. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, the... We got the term free gift here again, and uh, I, I just, it is mind boggling how uh, people can read free gift, free gift, free gift, free gift, and, and somehow later argue in a way that is contrary to something that's a free gift. There's no strings attached. I have another video titled uh, free gift, no strings attached. No ifs, ands, or buts, okay? Uh, it reminds me of a video. This is like one of my all-time favorite videos on YouTube. And it's by um, a YouTuber named uh, Street Preacher 1611 And I haven't seen his videos for a long time. I don't know what he's doing these days, but it's probably been about seven, eight years at least. That, and the video is titled Standing in State. And it's an animated video, but it's wonderful. I recommend everybody standing in state uh, by uh, Street Preacher 1611. But the point being made in it is that uh, I have a standing to God as righteous and justified, sanctified, and my standing before God cannot change. It's immutable. Nothing can change it. It's irrevocable uh, by God or by me. God cannot change it. Once, once uh, I, he's uh, indwelled and sealed me with the Holy Spirit and I'm born again, God cannot change it because he promised it. He can't break a promise. And he, he said, I have it and it's eternal. And, and, and therefore it cannot be undone. So he cannot lie. He cannot break a promise. So we can trust that it is settled and it's finished. Nothing can change my standing before God. I'm in good standing. That's what the word righteous means. Righteous means you're in good standing. You're in right standing. And then you have the other, and that's called state. At any given moment, our state could be really good or really bad. And that's why I said that every believer is is never in a state of uh, of static. Right? Amen, Luke. Amen. Good way to put it. We're gonna we're growing, and right now I, I think everybody here presently we're all growing. We're all focused on Jesus. We're focused on the on the on the brethren and the sistren, and we are we are all growing now in knowledge and understanding and fellowship. So we are growing spiritually. But if a person neglects Bible study, fellowship, ministry works, and, and uh, the prayer time, if they neglect those things, they don't just stay at a static state. They start to backslide. The old, the old man starts taking over. It's so positional versus experiential, and people mix those up. Exactly. Another way of saying it. Exactly. So our standing as saints cannot change. We're in good standing. You don't need to worry about that, okay? Um, even if you're a practicing homosexual, or even if you're someone that's criticizing those homosexuals, and uh, uh, I, I'm not like them, that's spiritual pride. Is that is that something to be concerned with? Uh, you know, uh, but our state at any given moment changes. We're either growing or declining or, or backsliding. Uh, the, the 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 parable that we call the parable of the prodigal son, I call it the parable of the backslidden son. That's really what the story is about. He backslides. 
His status as the father's son never changes throughout the whole story. He's, if he remains his son, nothing can change that status. But his state changes. He, he's out there living in the world, living as the world, and actually living in the pig pen. But he didn't become a pig, but it, he's living like a pig. But he, ne he never changes his identity as, as the man's son. Uh, all right, I'll go to the next verse unless you have any else have more to say. Oh, there is one last thing I want to say about that. What was it? I just oh, want to say God God can have some ungrateful brats as kids. Yeah, he certainly can. <laughs> yes. Did James say something? Hold on one second. He wants you to see Rigel. Okay. Okay. I have we want. I'm a kitty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a toddler and I'm a good boy. I'm a Treat me good. Poor little Rigel. He's just yeah. being loved all over the house. Now let me tell you something. You've got a black cat, and we know that black cats are evil. And you. I'm a witch. Be, you know, should not be only. Yes, that makes that makes Renee a witch. And I am a. And and, and, and and James, you're the witch's apprentice. And and I and 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 you know witches are made of wood, so you got to throw me into the pond and see if I float. <laughs> no, I'm Harry Potter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll read the next verse now in the KJV verse nineteen. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Sister? Yeah, it's a common one I use. It's basically saying the same thing. They're saying by the righteousness one. This time it's the obedience. As one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's Adam. So by the obedience of one, Jesus, many be made righteous. Again, it's not about us at all or our righteousness or our sin. We inherited this dead state. And so Jesus came to save us from that death. And so he gives us life by his obedience. That's the glorious gospel. It's that simple. Yeah. Okay, Brother Cripps. I'm sorry, I'm distracted. I guess I have to address this. So I'm getting a little bit of a problem from Adopted Son of Heaven from uh, Chase. He's mischaracterizing me in the chat room and what I said. And he's saying that Renee corrected me. And I, I hate to bring this up, but I'm not going to be mischaracterized by my comments. So I don't know how you want to deal with it. but um, Jason is not a babe in Christ. And, and I did not correct him at all. I was just adding to what he said. Well, he's he's said it more than once. And he's, he's um, mischaracterizing my comments as if I'm saying that uh, uh, someone that drinks no, uh, it doesn't have the Holy Spirit. That's what he's promoting in the chat room, and I'm That's, not going to put up with it. Okay, I'd like to clarify. It. That's not what Jason said. What Jason said is that if you're a saved person with the Holy Spirit and you are uh, uh, living your faith, you're not going to be at a standstill and that you can't change these things. You have to be saved so the Holy Spirit can begin to work in you. You can't start trying to clean yourself up in your dead state to come to God and be righteous, you have to be saved and then God begins the changes in you. Isn't that what you were saying? That is exactly what I was saying. I used a ridiculous example to try to make the point that alcoholism or whatever the sin is, even if it's uh, homosexuality, there's there's no difference. Yeah, it's it's it, you must have hit a nerve with the particular sin you mentioned, that's all. Well, I'm sure, and I said it in the chat room, but he kept going. So uh, that, that's what we—that's right. what we're dealing no, with. Chase, that was just a misunderstanding. I wasn't correcting Jason. I was adding to it, and I did not want him to be misunderstood. That's why I added to it. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me just say that, uh, Brother Cripps, I did see a comment from you saying that can't you, uh, the two of you, talk about this privately and work it out. So let's leave it at that, and. Uh, Brother, brother uh, um, Chase, uh, you know, you know that the chat room is. We need to keep it a place where we have fellowship, not not conflict and and strife. So um, let's let's uh, let's keep it that way, uh, or else we'll have to do something. 
All right, let's go on. Uh, let me see, Brother Cripps, did I, uh, did you talk about the verse yet? I can't remember now. Verse 19, yeah, it's your turn to talk about verse 19. Yeah, so uh, basically, I, he he's keeps pounding this point home. Uh, for one man's disobedience, which is, again is Adam, many were made sinners. All, er, all of us are sinners. And by that same right, so by the obedience of one, by the obedience of, of the Son of God, many be made righteous. So again, it's the same point that he goes verse after verse. And I'm so grateful. This is the only thing I want to say about this, because I certainly have plenty of sin in my life, plenty. And fortunately, by the Holy Spirit working in my life, um, even if I am sinned, I'm just justified, just as if I'd never sinned. I'm made righteous by the obedience of Christ because he never sinned. That was the only way it was going to work. And it covers a multitude of sins, as we keep saying, which includes anything that a person struggles with in their life. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chase, uh, I'm going to remove your your wrench uh, for now. Maybe I can give it back to you later, but uh, looks like you're misusing your wrench. Okay, let's, uh, <clears throat> uh, that verse, uh, I'm gonna Pray, read Praise that. God. I'm gonna re read that verse in the Amplified. Uh, verse 19 says, for just as th through one man's disobedience, his failure to hear his carelessness the man the many were made sinners so through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous and acceptable to god and brought into right standing with him there it is that right standing i, I like the, the way righteousness and right standing that's the right way to understand uh, the word righteousness is that we're in right standing you're in good standing don't worry nothing to worry about Amen. Praise you. Yeah. Time for the loop dance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So the, the distinction here is there, again, it's about two people. You got Adam, the one that, that caused a problem for all humanity, and Jesus, the one that provided the solution for all humanity. Uh, and so the, the question, it, it, it's important for people to understand the uh, um, we, we're 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 we we're born with and inherited this problem. Um, so it, it some people they like to think that hey, it all has to do is if we can get control of this in, on our own and and uh, get our sin under control. But no, it's not. It's not even just what you do. It's what you are. The problem is what you are. Uh, you're dead spiritually. You need to be brought to life spiritually. You need to receive eternal life. Uh, all right, let's uh, go to the next verse. Okay, the next verse, verse 20 in the KJV. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Sister Renee? This, I was going to say, is one of my favorite favorite verses in Romans because it tells you the whole point of the law and it ain't the savior. It's so you can have your sin come up to the surface. Do we make void the law? No, we establish the law way up here. We show you, you don't meet that standard. You need God's righteousness. So moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound so that the sin would come right up to the surface, be stirred up and show you you're not good. You think you're good. You think you keep God's laws, but according to his standards, you fall short of the glory. So the law is given to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, to show us our need for a savior because that law is given to make us guilty and to shut up our mouths so that all are equally lost or dead, like Jason was saying earlier, and we all turn to Christ. So the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, 
grace did much more abound. So regardless of how severe the sin was, grace was greater. So this is the problem. Preachers and false Christians are teaching this damnable doctrine that where sin abounds, grace does much more diminish. That God's grace shrinks down and is ineffective for anybody that willfully makes a mistake. And you can't willfully sin because they don't understand that verse in Hebrews that we sin willfully, which is about rejecting Jesus and going back to the law and animal sacrifice. Again, context is key, but that's where they get this false doctrine from. Uh, and they have uh, deceived themselves into, uh, into thinking they're actually keeping the law now when they don't sin. I had one babe in Christ tell me, I haven't sinned at all today. I haven't sinned in like uh, several months. Oh my gosh. Had one Pentecostal man say, I haven't sinned in 40 years. I thought I'd fall on my face. Like that they, they do not understand the, the, the standards of the law. So the law entered that the offense might abound. Paul tells us he didn't even know coveting until uh, the law told him not to covet. And then it killed him. Good. Cause you got to die. So you can be resurrected in Christ. So the offense abounds, but where sin abounds, grace does and did much more abound. The grace of God is far more powerful than any sin. Again, Jesus didn't catch leprosy. They caught his cleanliness. And that is why we can rejoice. That is why we have such joy. The sun sets free is free indeed. You know you can rest, like Brother Luke said. We have a license to rest. Because we who have believed do enter into rest. The promised land is the shadow of the rest we have in Christ. The Sabbath day Sabbath is the rest we have in Christ. And it's so sad that most don't. But this is one of my favorite verses. To show you the point of the law is not so you keep it to save yourself or to meet some standard to please God because the law is not of faith and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. You want to please God and get on his good side? Trust him. Believe that when he sent his son to die for you, that he saved you and, and you cannot be lost. You put your trust, your faith, your reliance upon him. You put your soul in his hands and say, I trust you. I trust you with my soul. That's how you please God. That's why I said the work of God is to believe on he whom he sent. And whosoever lives and believes in him shall never die. And whosoever uh, uh, believes in him, though he, though he be dead, yet shall he live. So uh, th it's just fabulous. This verse should tell you no matter what sin. <laughs> See, the sin problem was dealt with. I, I'm so sick of it. Sins. It's sin. S-I-N. The sin as a whole, sins uh, in the form of sin in general, has been dealt with. Jesus paid for every bit of sin that was committed and will be committed on this earth by anyone from Adam till God knows when. And that was dealt with. You got to believe it because that's believing the gospel. Amen. Yeah, Amen. And I noticed Z. Will was saying that uh, all all glory goes to God. And I, I'll say Amen to that, uh, Z. Will. Uh, uh, that's that's the thing is that the if we point out anything on our part, then then um, all the glory does not go to Jesus. Only if we if we keep ourselves out of it and say, it's not anything I've done, it's what Jesus has done for me. It has to be all about Jesus. As soon as you bring yourself into it and make it some kind of a formula, what Jesus did plus what I do, it's spoiled, it's ruined, it's useless, it's of none effect. So the only way you really, all the glory does go to Jesus is if you keep yourself out of it. And that applies. We need to flip that around. I need to keep myself out of it and say it's all glory to Jesus. But that I need to apply that rule to others too, homosexuals or drunks or anybody else, whatever their problem is. I, I don't want to bring their conduct 
their uh, either ability or, or inability to do good, that has nothing to do with it. If that if we if we introduce that, then the, the glory is not reserved for Jesus. A person has the right to boast. But Paul says, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of, of works? Nay, but the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. All glory to Jesus. All right, Brother Cripps, uh, give me your amplification on that verse uh, 20, please. Yeah, first all, glory to Jesus indeed. That was a good comment. Thanks for that. Yeah, so um, the offense abounds. I, I love what Renee said about uh, stopping their mouths or shutting their mouths. That's all the law was for, was to shut our mouths and let us know how wicked we are and how much we needed a Savior. That's all it was for. It doesn't save anybody. The only thing that saves anyone is what Christ already did on the cross, which does cover all sins, all of them. There's not a section of sins that, that's left uncovered. They're all sin. They're, they're, all, they're all covered, all sins covered. And it's covered by the abundant grace, the abounding grace of God. It's out of his love for us that he did this in the first place. The whole thing is about love. And his grace is, is hyper, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, hyper grace. And in this verse, it says, uh, grace did much more abound. Yeah, that's that's another way of saying hyper grace. There's there's no limit to God's God's grace. And when we when we compare how 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 gracious, forgiving He is compared to our undeservedness, then we can really see that it really does abound. Let me read that in the Amplified and see how it's stated. Uh, for just as through one man's disobedience, his that is his failure to hear, his carelessness. Oh, am I? Wait a second. Am I on the right verse? I, I'm. I read verse nineteen. I'm twenty. Sorry, verse twenty. But the law came to increase and expand the awareness of the trespass by defining and unmasking sin. But where sin increased, God's remarkable gracious gift of grace, that is his unmerited favor, has surpassed it and increased all the more. Yeah, uh, he did an excellent job amplifying the thoughts on that verse. Uh, but well, I like this term in the in the KJV where it says "moreover." So basically, Paul is saying, "But in addition to that," so he gives us a thought in verse nineteen, talking about uh, one man's disobedience. So here he's talking about Adam. Okay, so in verse nineteen, it's all about Adam and Jesus. But now in verse twenty, he brings it forward and says. But in addition to the problem with Adam and the sin that's passed down to us, uh, uh, and our inherited, um, you know, uh, state, moreover, the law entered. So in addition to the Adam problem, we have the problem of the law. And the law was introduced so that sin will abound, so that we men will recognize how sinful we really are. And, and shut our mouths so we can never go before God boasting. Uh, so uh, I like that word moreover because he's saying, in addition to the Adam problem, we have the law problem. And, but as it says here, the law did serve a purpose. The law came to increase and expand the awareness of the trespass. This is the Amplified. The law came to increase and expand the awareness of the trespass by defining and unmasking sin. Okay? All right. Um, we've all talked about verse 20, right? So anything else before I go on to verse 21? All right, then. Verse 21 in the KJV. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness 
unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Sister Renee? Hey, I, I think it's interesting. I think uh, Jason will agree too. Every verse in this chapter is saying the exact same thing in a different way over and over again. He's saying it's not of yourselves. Your state as a sinner and the death sentence is not of yourself. Your righteousness and eternal life and salvation is not of yourself. And because it's not of yourself, this is that what you need to understand. Because of Adam, you die. Because of Christ, you live. So what he did for you, uh, uh, it, it's all him. And he gets all the glory. So you need to trust in him. It clearly tells us, again, in summary, that as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace, or there's that might again. People will be like, yeah, it might if you do this not it it's it's saying therefore grace will reign but that's not how they worded it it's old english that as sin is reigned unto death even so my grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by christ jesus our lord now that upon its own could be taken out of context so you got to live righteous but they're not uh uh taking context here where earlier in the chapter it says by one man's righteousness so it's the righteousness of god it's jesus's righteousness that reigns unto eternal life by Christ Jesus. So as sin reigned unto death, Adam's sin, even so might grace reign through, and we need to put Jesus's righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, because it'd be easy for someone to take that out of context and say, see, you got to live a certain way and be righteous and stuff. Um, but I, the whole chapter is telling you none of it is of yourself. And it's completely outside of yourself. Um, and it's basically explaining the semantics of how salvation works and why it isn't about us. It isn't about our performance. It was a problem that the world had because of uh, the sin of one man. The world, I mean, the creation itself is groaning. So Jesus came to redeem every living thing, a new heaven and a new earth, including man. But we're the only ones that can say, eh, nah, I don't think I'll have that. I mean, that, that's how wicked our hearts are. Rather than set aside our pride and say, I can't help myself. What I do really just doesn't even matter as far as salvation goes. I've got to trust in Christ and be at his mercy. No, we, we, have, we would rather stay lost and, 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 and be able to boast than to just flat out admit that it has nothing to do with us at all. You know, I think that's why he has to drive it home. When you see when Paul is talking about salvation, how redundant he is, how many times he says the same thing in different ways. Because they, they the, the minute he gets people saved and in joy and in victory, the false teachers come in and the Judaizers saying, yeah, but you got to be a Jew too. You got to keep the law of Moses. You got to offer animal sacrifices. You got to be circumcised. You know, so he has to uh, keep running this point home. And but every verse is saying the same thing. It's amazing. Huh. Okay. Yeah. It's uh. Well, Paul does. He 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 not only builds. He's a very very uh, smart and uh, a systematic. The way he builds a case and, and then also repeats a point to, to drive it home so that there's it's inescapable <laughs> and even then people try to escape the conclusion therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law that's the conclusion that you should make from all paul's uh teachings brother cripps Yes, uh, Renee, I definitely agree with everything you just said. He is pounding at home, and uh, it must have been the same back then as it is now, <laughs> because we're trying to to make people understand it the the same concepts that Paul's trying to make people understand it from different directions back then. People still don't get it. They they still want to make it be about something else. So they uh, they they want to boast. That's a good point, Renee. They want to boast. Um, for me, I would just rather tell everyone every single sin that I can possibly think of 
And surprise, surprise, there's going to be some, some that I'm not aware of. There's going to be plenty of sin that I'm not aware of in the eyes of God. Sin of omission on top of that. Yep. All the good things. Just went, you're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. That's it. Fail That's to do that. If you worry, you, if you got a problem and you don't trust that God's going to work it out and you get some kind of fear over it. Amen. Not a faith. Pe people just cannot get that God's standard really is perfection. That means even our good deeds are filthy rags because most of the good we do comes from a selfish motive. We want to feel good about what we did for them and we want them to acknowledge that we did it. Yes. You know, but I heard someone explain the love of God differently than the love man has. See, when we love a child and he doesn't love us back, we mourn because we lose something. But when God loves his children and they don't love him back, he mourns for us because of what we've lost. Ooh. Ooh. He mourns for us because he wants us to have it. Mm. Because of what is not what he loses. Amen. So, and I think that that's the, that's the difference. That's just one difference in, uh, of how uh, holy and perfect God is. They think God is some like legalist up there waiting for people to mess up. He had a beer. You, you watched that movie. It had dirty words in it. It's just, it's not like that. No, At that's all, what I don't see him. That I don't know what God they have, but my God just loves me. And I really just feel like the way I please him is just to trust in that. Just trust him that he loves me. I talk to him all the time. I'm like, oh, I fell short. But I'm, I'm, I don't feel like he's telling me, stop, you know, stop bringing up all the bad you're doing. You're my child. You're beloved. I know who you are in my son. Like, you know, I'm supposed to be reminded because the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't convict of sin. It, it convinces the sinners because they don't believe. It mm -hmm. tells us that. Mm -hmm. But he also convinces us of righteousness because he went back to the Father. So the Holy Spirit bears witness that we are in right standing with God. The conscience convicts you of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your right standing with God. I, I'm sick of people saying the Holy Spirit is the one that's constantly accusing you. You know? No, oh it's, it's that's that. not his job. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's the comforter. Yeah, who's comforter. who's the accuser? What's the name of the accuser? It is the accuser of the brethren. <laughs> oh my gosh! I I I mean, they put the the wicked one's deeds on God. They make God in their image. Yeah, you know, Jesus said the harlots and the publicans will enter heaven. Do you notice he didn't say ex harlots? He didn't. Mm -mm. <laughs> he didn't say ex harlots. He even said those that break the commandments and teach others to do it will be least in the kingdom, but they'll get there before them. Amen. <laughs> you know, so uh, religion, uh, that Muslim doctor I was talking to today, I, I, I used Christmas as a means to drop the conversation in there. It's very touchy. You know, I just planted a seed. But he said, well, the most important thing are the Ten Commandments. Hmm. Fair enough. I'm not, I wouldn't want to get an argument. I'm just trying to get him to see Jesus was crucified and rose again. Yeah. You know, but uh, it's amazing to me how many people think they're good. Like you ask any Muslim and say, oh, I try to do more good than bad. I do the Hajj. I, and you ask Catholics, oh, I try to live as much of the Bible as I can. And I try to keep God's laws. And I'm a good person. I've never, no, you're not. No, you're not. Even the good you do is has selfish motives to it. And mm -hmm. I can see it in myself. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, and the Holy Spirit so, helps us with that too. I love them for their sake or for mine. Mm -hmm. And I find I love people a lot of times for me. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm having to uh to to look at these things. These are the deep things that that I I wonder is the I just don't believe these people are saved because the Holy Spirit should be revealing to them. Not I get so many messages, I gotta tell you guys. There was a time I was getting so many of them. I did a video of it. This is what they'd say. The father gave me a message about you. Yep. This sin and that sin. I'm like, huh? Well, the father's got a direct link to me. He That's knows right. You don't, you don't need someone to.
on YouTube. He's <laughs> never talked to me about other people's business. Yeah. Everything he said to me, if I go complaining to him about something somebody's done to me, he'll always point it back to me. What yeah. I can do differently. So I don't know who you're talking to, but the father doesn't gossip as far as I know. Yeah, you It's know? a one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and God and it has nothing to do with anyone else out there in the YouTube sphere. I shake in my boots <clears throat> to say, thus saith the Lord or the father told me. Yep, or, I got a word for you. Really, that makes me shake and tremble. I even uh, waited a long time to do my channel. I wanted to make sure that I had my gospel solid and that I wasn't doing anything that would be wrong. You know, I, I was very mindful of that. But now people can think they're saved because they repented of their sins, which is the biggest joke on the planet. Nobody's ever done that. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll come out and start correcting pastors of 40 years. Yeah. And they're all experts hearing from God and their special dreams and visions because they got to get credibility somehow because they don't have it as, as elders or as any biblical knowledge. Mm -hmm. they, they just have to say they had some supernatural revelation of visitation or, a, you know, a visit or a vision or a dream. True. You know, and that's how these ministries start. People yeah. start believing this non-biblical stuff. Yeah. The, the last thing I wanted to point out about uh, the verse there is after all this pounding on the same point, the beauty of uh, verse 21, he makes it clear again. And then he's showing the contrast, the contrast between the two things. So sin reigned unto death. And then the contrast is righteousness unto eternal life. Amen. There's the final contrast after all this uh, pounding. That's a, this. That's a really good point. Thank you. Praise God. Well, uh, one thought on the verse 21 that we haven't talked about. Uh, I, I think there's a real big problem with the word Lord. Uh, I've said this before, but particularly the, the Lordship heretics. Uh, every time they see the word Lord, uh, they want to interpret it as master, as in he's in charge and you better obey. And that's what Lord means according to them. But if you really uh, look at the word Lord and, uh, and in these ca this case and many other cases, Unless the context is saying something otherwise, if the context tells you it's talking about you serving him and he's your Lord and you're his uh, servant, then uh, the context says it, then it's correct. But if, the, if it's not in the context, you should always assume that the word Lord is saying God. So here when it says, uh, even so, my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our God. That's the way we should understand the Lord, unless, unless it ex clearly is, uh, the meaning is different. And, uh, but the Lordship heretics, they every time they see the word Lord, I mean, after all, the most important word in the Bible to them is the word Lord, so that they can say, He's got to, um, you know, have you ever heard someone say, if he's, if he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. But they're talking about Lord as in, you've got to give, surrender your life over to him. And yeah, I, we should. I hope we can all surrender our life over him and, and, and let him direct our lives and be in charge. But that's not the way we should understand the word Lord in the scriptures. He, the Lord in the scripture should be understood is he is God and therefore he is worthy of our worship. I, well, I want to follow him. I want to serve him. I want him to he be in charge of my life and direct my path. But in these cases where we see the word Lord, we should all understand it as uh, he is worthy of our worship as God. Um, when we finish the chapter, uh, but uh, there's quite a few things in the in the chat room that I'd like to for us to look at and, and respond to, and uh, we've been uh, uh, we're approaching two hours, so that's a good length for the study, plus uh, 
I know it's getting late, so uh, let's kind of yeah, send you I, um, I'm I'm pretty sore. I'm gonna try to answer a question, but I got to get Jim to bed and stand up. <laughs> yeah, let's just see if there's anything here that we should respond to very quickly. There's a few comments that I thought uh, we should address. Uh, so I'll scroll backwards in here. Um, Ray, tell Jim Jim nobody wants to see the cat anymore. Nobody wants to see the cat anymore? <laughs> yeah, tell him not to show the cat anymore. <laughs> he loves that cat. I know. I was just joking. I, I I typed it in the chat. He didn't respond, but he, maybe he didn't see it. I said, quit, quit showing the cat. God, he was laughing. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. If people get the wrong idea. I just want to clarify. That's all. No, he, was, he knows you're teasing. He's got me as a mother. He's not easily offended. Okay. Um, well, there's a, a disagreement about the Holy Spirit convicting the believers. I know that some people uh, say that uh, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, but once we're, we are a believer, the Holy Spirit uh, does not convict us anymore. Maybe you can give us your thoughts on that, Renee or, or Crips. I'll go ahead and I'll what? look for more comments. What 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 comment? I was answering a question about the department. The, the, the question is, does the Holy Spirit convict a believer of sin? No, the conscience convicts people of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our right standing with God. It tells us uh, when Jesus said, I must go so the comforter can come. And when he comes, he'll convict the world of sin because they do not believe. So the only sin the Holy Spirit convicts a person of is their unbelief in Christ. Once that's done, he convicts the saved person of their right standing with God. He tells them who they are in Christ so that they can go about um, uh, manifesting the truth of who God says they already are. That's the whole point. See, the law brings a curse it condemns you it shuts you down it, it, it and and the holy spirit doesn't come to accuse us it will remind us hey not condemn you but hey that's not who you are you're a child of the king you're a child of the most high god that is not your character now you are the righteousness of god it will it, he will tell you who you are so that you can go about manifesting that but he doesn't convict you of sin. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the Holy Spirit, who's supposed to be the comforter, will come and convict you every time you sin. No, he convicts the unbeliever of sin, singular sin of unbelief. Jesus bore all the sins of the world on him, on the cross. But unbelief is the one sin that will keep you lost. You go to, and ultimately it's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's saying the works of God are the works of Satan, that you don't believe that Jesus's work uh, will save you. So uh, th that's the sin he convicts. But I I I'm so sick of people mixing up Satan accusing us and saying that's the Holy Spirit. Is it comforting when I come to you and go, oh my gosh, you're a drunk. God's not going to love you unless you stop. No. But wouldn't it help you if I told you, do you know how beloved you are of the Father? Do you know he sees you as perfect in your positional standing? And he wants you to know that this is not who you actually are. And, you know, he wants you to put on the new man. He's got plans for your life. He's got, he's got a purpose for your life. And the devil wants to sidetrack you from that. So he's here to remind you that you are beloved of God, that you already died with Christ. And that old man you're feeding, let's consider him dead. Let's reckon him dead to sin so that we can be alive in Christ and serve the purpose God has for you. That's how you get victory, proclaiming who you are in Christ, not being condemned because you failed once again in your flesh. So I do not believe the Holy Spirit convicts people of sins I believe he convicts of sin, the sin of unbelief. And then he goes on to comfort the believer to help them in their walk, to be and manifest who God says they are in Christ. Yeah. The, uh, 
Z, Z will is convinced that uh, you're wrong there. And, but I, what I would ask Z, Z will to do is, can you give me a verse that, that specifically states what you're claiming? And he says, the Holy Spirit convicts, though, and that is biblical. It is a healthy conviction, though, not with guilt and shame, but swift, healthy conviction. Uh, if you can give us a verse to consider for that, I'd like to see that. But um, I, I think the problem here, Z will, uh, you, you, this seems to be a recurring theme for you. And, 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 and that is you seem to be very, very conscious and focusing on sin. Your own sin, you, you know, you, the spirits, the spirits convicting you of it, I guess. And, and other people's sin, they better also feel really guilty and, and be, uh, what was the word you used before? They have to feel, be disgusted by their sin. It seems to me that you're kind of obsessed with sin, and uh, we're not. We shouldn't be doing that. We we should be not sin focused, but sun focused. It, it's a it, the, our our salvation and our relationship uh, is it's a um, it's a sun issue. Our relationship with Jesus. If we stay focused on Jesus, like right now. Uh, are any of us sinning right now as we're having fellowship, as we're praising Jesus, as we're focused on Jesus? Now, the last thing on our mind right now is is sinning. We're not making plans to sin. We're not uh, we're not actually practicing it right now in any way. We, we're because we're focusing on Jesus. All eyes on Christ always, not sin. Like you said, it does nothing. The law makes you guilty. We shouldn't be carrying that junk. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. And, and we're, if we are, if we just continually stay focused on Jesus, then you don't need to worry about you. You're not going not to be sinning. Uh, but also, uh, what about rest? Is there some reason why you can't rest? Is there some reason why you can't let others rest? We, we should be able to rest in our uh, salvation, in our faith and relationship with Jesus, in our promise of eternal life, and rest and not have to worry. You are in right standing. And if you're in right standing, you don't have to worry about it. And, uh, um, yeah, it just seems to me that your uh, your theme tonight, Z. Will, is, is sin, sin, sin still. But, hey, it is finished. Believe him. It's finished. Hebrews says you should have no more consciousness of sin. Hebrews says you should have had no more consciousness of sin, meaning that you should realize there is no more sin on your account positionally. Positionally, all that's been wiped out. So if you keep your eyes on Christ, like, like Luke says, see, it's the opposite. People think the more you look at the law and rules, the more holy you'll be. But it's the opposite. The more you abide in grace and look at Jesus and realize his love for you and take from him, that's when you get victory. Peter sank when he looked at his problem. But when he kept his eyes on Christ, he could walk on the water. I'm not going to look at the storm, my sin and my failures of the flesh. I'm going to keep focused on Jesus. And like Luke said, you're not even thinking about sinning. You're thinking about Jesus. You know, abiding in more rules and laws and fear that does nothing but paralyze you. And I'm not saying ignore sin like it's not a problem. But honestly, I don't think about sin. Am I sinning? Does God love me? Am I dis? No, I don't. Because I know instinctively that I am loved. And I know who I am in Christ. And that he cares. He cares that I trust him and I believe his promises. And how I treat others and how I'm spiritually growing in grace and in patience and in compassion for others. You know, these things are overlooked, but they're so much more important than stupid worldly things. Taste not, touch not, handle not. And Paul says they have a form of wisdom, but it's really will worship. It, you're, you're really looking to your own willpower as some kind of means of pleasing God. And so we're not saying... You know, sin's fine. We just love sin. It, it's just nobody's thinking about that. We are free to rest in Christ. And so we're free to be who he says we are. And I think that's where our mindset needs to be. Paul said that the law, thou shalt not covet, slew him. The law, the letter kills. 
So we just need to let that go. Let that law, because sin is transgression of the law. When you're constantly looking at sin, you are looking at the law and it kills. You need to look at grace and that's how you grow. It's the opposite of what man thinks. It, it's foolishness to, to those people that don't believe because they don't get it. They think the more rules and laws, the better people will be. But it's the exact opposite. It stirs up rebellion and strengthens sin. The strength of sin is the law. Yeah, I was going to follow up. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead and follow up. I was just going to say, I guess that's pretty much uh, all we need to do in the chat room. But I don't see any other questions or points to, to discuss. So, um, after you uh, make your remarks, Brother Cripps, uh, let's start summing up our thoughts on the study and, uh, and we'll close it out. Sure. I was just going to follow up, Renee, by saying uh, Z. Will uh, makes it very clear what the issue of thinking is. He says, and this is a quote, uh, conviction is healthy. It makes us better people. And it, that's completely incorrect. And it's because of the way he is focusing on the sin and, and not on uh, the status of righteousness that's given unto those that believe. Um, we don't have to focus on all that. Uh, I think we've said in several different ways that, that that sin is forgiven. It's the free gift, and that's what's being talked about in the passage. What makes me, I won't speak for any other believers, but what makes me a better person is the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and the gratitude that comes from realizing everything that Christ did for me and that he loved me so much that he sent his son into the world to save me because I couldn't do it. The, what God needed is perfection because he's perfect. We can't be perfect. So he sent his son to be perfect for us. And that covers all sin, as, the, as all these verses are trying to point out. Uh, grace is the mechanism in which we are saved by the imputed righteousness of Christ and his shed blood on the cross. It's not, it's not from anything else. Our own works don't save us. It's by what Christ did for us. And it's by the abounding grace that abounds because sin was there in the first place. And it much more abounds. Thanks, guys. You guys, I've got to go. I mean, I'm starting to be in a lot of pain. I've got to stand up and, and get some blood flowing to my leg and get my boy to sleep. I've got to get up. But, good night, uh, Ray. Say good night, and, and then you're, you're gone. All right. I love y'all very much. I was so happy to be with all of you. And I love that the fire is coming back into my heart and I'm able bye, to guys. concentrate a little bit. He wants to say bye bye. Bye guys. See, no kitty. No kitty. No, no kitty. There you go. If you want to see now, the kitty, you got to go to James's channel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'm going to start to upload them there. Yep. And Kitty's if you want to watch me, I'll be making videos every one or two days. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you, sister. Night, guys. And, uh, I'm sure everybody's glad that you're you felt well enough to at least um, deal deal with it as best. It you was can. great. It was yeah. great, and Jason. It was always great to hear your amazing voice. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, when, when you get better, we'll have a talk about uh, doing voiceovers and stuff. Sounds great. And uh, Luke, I missed your dance, your happy dance. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, I'll let you go, and then I'll let Brother Crip say good night, and then uh, then we'll finish up. All right, good night, guys. Uh, appreciate everyone in the chat room, and I do apologize if uh, I came across a little upset, but I was getting. Um, little flustered. I don't like when my comments are being uh, mischaracterized, but I feel like it got cleared up. And um, so I'm very grateful for the fellowship, everyone that knows me and uh, knows that when I make comments on here, because they've listened to other broadcasts and actually do listen and pay attention to my heart and the things that I say, um, that if there's a question about a comment that I make, all you have to do is ask me. I, you know, I'm happy. I'm an open book. And that's because um, I, I, I'm grateful for what, uh, the Holy spirit has done in my life. And, um, I just want to reach out to people and I want to be, be able to fellowship. And, um, and this is one of the reasons why I do these, um, these Bible studies and all the other shows that I'm involved with. And you guys are what make it happen. I mean, just, just overwhelmed by the amount of support I get from you guys. And, uh, thank you, brother Luke. For letting me be a part of another Bible study. It's always enlightening for me and uh, very, very grateful. Good night. 
All right, thank you, brother. Uh, okay, uh, I I wanted to say to all of the uh, regular members of the congregation, I appreciate you being here again. And if it's uh, if you're new here, I, I I hope that you'll come back, and uh, I hope that uh, yeah, you know that uh, you are welcome. And I also hope that everybody can see that uh, we don't always agree, even. In our own discussions here on the panel, sometimes we'll disagree, and and in the chat room, sometimes people disagree. But we we go out of our way to be polite uh, as we disagree, so that it's a friendly, comfortable environment for everybody. And I, I hope if you're a newcomer here that you you uh, uh, you understand that's uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, now I will announce that uh, for the Friday night interviews I'm doing, I. I'm planning on interviewing Brenda Z on the 11th, but this next Friday, uh, day after tomorrow, I'm not going to have the Friday night interview because I want to yield to uh, uh, Talk and Doctrine so that all the focus can go uh, on his program. He's going to be talking to Chris Date about Calvinism and free will. So that's the only, you know, time it could be scheduled and rather having divided audience uh, i'd rather have everybody focus on that so we'll uh, uh the next program for church eternally secure is on our sunday program and then next wednesday and then the that, that next friday will be um, tentatively we're planning on interviewing brenda z okay so thank you for everybody for participating and uh look forward to seeing you next time bless you all in the name of our great savior god Jesus.